Have you ever wondered what a slug with the same powers as Magneto might look like if we made it into a D&D monster? Probably not, because you're a sane person. But there's no room for sanity here, because this week we are talking about the Sword Slug. Hello and welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old creatures from past editions of D&D and other tabletop role-playing games and bring them to light for use in your current 5th edition D&D campaign! Oh my god. My name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we are talking about the Metal Master. The Metal Master, often referred to as the Sword Slug, is exactly that. It is a slug which exhibits a mastery over metallic objects. This large purple slug creature is able to manipulate metal much like Magneto himself, and it can do pretty much all the stuff we've seen Magneto do with that ability. It can pull things closer, it can repel them away, it can create a tornado of blades, and it's got a pretty gnarly bite. So as always, we're going to talk about just exactly what this creature is, what it can do in combat and outside of combat, and some ways that you can use it in your game with some hefty plot and adventure hooks. This monster originally came to us from D&D 3rd edition, but most of you probably already know that in the description below you can find my conversion of this creature into a 5th edition monstrosity. But whether you're running this creature in 3.5 or 5e, you better leave the plate armor at home because it is time for... One of the biggest drawbacks that the slug and snail type creatures have is they're often quite slow. And the Metal Master is no exception. It clocks in with a speed of 20 feet per round, which honestly isn't that heinous considering, you know, it's a giant slug. But we also know that that's slower than almost any PC is going to be, so most people are going to be able to outrun this thing by just walking away. However, the Metal Master's solution to that problem is simple. It's able to use its magnetize ability to affect all creatures made of metal or metal objects within 60 feet of it, and what it does with this ability is it can choose to either drag them 30 feet closer or push them 30 feet away. This of course is not going to affect any creatures who aren't wearing metal, but it's going to pull weapons out of hands, and if a creature happens to be wearing full plate or chainmail or any type of armor that you as the DM deem has enough metal on it for them to be affected, they have to make a strength saving throw to resist being dragged or pushed away. So your wizards and sorcerers and I guess monks as well kind of get a free pass on this one. But for those in the party that have to wear metal or use metal to fight, this can be a huge problem. Because say the rogue in the party is just wearing leather armor or even studded leather is debatable and they don't have to make the saving throw, if they're using say a rapier, that's probably made of metal, which means unless they can make a strength saving throw to hang on to it, it's going to get torn right out of their hands and pulled onto the slug. This ability to control and manipulate metal is also reflected by its repel metal trait. This trait is pretty straightforward. Basically, it means whenever a creature attacks it with a weapon made of metal, it does so at disadvantage. Because, you know, if someone's trying to stab you with a sword and you can manipulate metal, you're probably going to try to push it away. I would describe this to the players as feeling kind of like the sensation of putting two magnets with opposing fields against each other, except obviously much, much stronger. Another trait this creature has, which further emphasizes its mastery over metallic objects, is it can detect metal. Basically, this creature automatically senses the presence of metal within 60 feet of it. So unless the rogue wants to get out that crystal dagger, no sneak attacks for you. It's also able to cast spells. Well a spell, and that spell is telekinesis. The limitation here is that I can only use this to target one object or creature completely made of metal. Telekinesis is a pretty diverse spell. You can pick things up, lift them into the air, move them around, so go nuts on the creativity front with that. I just have an image of this thing picking up a paladin in full plate and dropping them off a cliff or something, and and I mean, dying from a Magneto ripoff that also happens to be a slug is probably one of the worst ways to go. Like, there are more gruesome deaths, but there are a few deaths that are more shameful. This creature, of course, does have a maw of razor-sharp teeth, which means it does have a bite attack. It's mostly going to be focusing on using its other abilities, but hey, if it's up close and personal with someone, it can give them a chomp. The other metal-related ability, which is more offensive than its magnetize ability that this creature has access to, is a little trick called Metal Storm. Essentially, it can take all 
all the metal shards sticking to it, which by this point in the fight could include a few of the player's weapons, and turned it into a 20-foot tornado of metal objects swirling around it, causing lots of slashing damage and destruction. Any creature that starts its turn within the whirlwind of metal pieces or enters it during their turn is going to take 5d8 points of slashing damage. This effect lasts for one round, so when it uses it, it still is up until the start of its next turn. However, while this ability is active, a lot of the metal plates and stuff that are on its body, which act as a sort of semi-natural armor, are now whirling around. This means the creature gets a minus two to its armor class, so it's a little bit easier to hit, but it's a lot more dangerous to get close to. All in all, the Metal Master is not going to be moving around too much. It's mostly going to be dragging and pushing things away from it to try to manipulate the battlefield, which is really interesting. I love creatures like this that take a kind of mundane seeming encounter and then shift the battlefield to its advantage in unforeseeable ways. But that should give you a good idea of what this creature can do, and I guess the TLDR here is it's Magneto but a slug. So now that you know how it fights, let's learn why it fights and talk about some. So in terms of plot hooks, this creature has so much potential. It is just kind of a wild beast. It's pretty dumb. It has an intelligence of six, which means it's not quite as stupid as most animals, which tend to have a one to a three. So it's like on the cusp of sentience. I mean, I've seen some barbarians that are dumber than this guy, but it's also not going to be articulating finely crafted and philosophical thoughts. It's going to behave like an animal. It's mostly interested in survival. It's not particularly aggressive, but you know, it's also gonna eat, and the most viable target for it to eat are things such as creatures wearing metal. Because, you know, it can drag them into its mouth and chomp away. But because it has that bit of extra intelligence which most animals don't have, that means we can do a little bit more with the creature. One of these guys would be extremely useful, invaluable even, working in a blacksmith or metalworker's shop. They're often referred to as sword slugs because, you know, they have all these sharp pieces of metal all over them and also they can pull swords out of people's hands. Some of the pieces on them might literally be swords from past meals or adventurers. But that nickname could take on a whole new meaning if it were working for a blacksmith. Imagine it lifting hot metal into the air and placing it into the quench or bending and altering metals so that the smith could make all kinds of different weapons and armor designs that normally wouldn't be possible. So if you don't want to run them in combat, but you like the idea of including this creature in your game, making them as sort of a, not quite a partner, but not quite a pet to a metal worker of some kind would be really interesting. And I mean, hey, if the slug is willing to help the smithy with their work, getting a bunch of free food or free food as far as they're concerned on the side ain't a bad deal. If you wanted to make this less of a fringe detail and have a more involved plot line, maybe a smithy hires the party to go out and capture one of these things so that they can get a leg up on their rivals. Or perhaps the party is tasked with finding out the secret to how this one blacksmith in town is able to make all these extraordinary pieces of armor that seem unbelievable in their creation. And they find out that this guy's got a metal master locked in the back room, and perhaps the party chooses to help free it. While they do have an above average intelligence, they're not exactly smart enough to speak, and they don't have a language of their own, so think of them like a really, really smart dog. You could always assign them a language though if you wanted to go that route and kind of make them a little bit more of an NPC. I mean, if you wanted to give them even a bit more intelligence, you could make them the blacksmith themselves and have them be this kind of like weird blacksmith that lives off in the mountains that the party goes after in search of this legendary weapon made by this legendary smith, come to find out that he's a slug. As a CR4 monster, these creatures also fit perfectly within the realm of reasonability for random encounters. If you want to throw a slug encounter at your party that's something different beside the giant slugs or flail snails that we see in the monster books, a metal master could be a really interesting creature. Or if you want to take the industry angle up a whole notch, maybe you have like a city that uses these metal masters in conjunction with architects and stuff to build their buildings. All in all, the Metal Master is such a unique and weird creature. It's like exactly the type of monster I love to see show up in a D&D game. Something that'll make your players go, huh, that's not what I expected and that's really cool. But without having like ridiculous 
impossible to overcome abilities. They just have such a diverse range. I mean, you can incorporate them literally as these random little side additions to just make the world feel a bit more fleshed out, or you can use them as like a huge component of it or a random encounter, or maybe the pet of a big bad evil guy Warforged who then uses it to lift him in the air and holy shit, that sounds awesome. Imagine a Warforged villain who uses a Metal Master as a mount and the Metal Master is able to use its telekinetic abilities to like move the Warforged around and stuff in combat. Or maybe even pull the Warforged villain's body apart, try to shred the party with it and then put it back together. There's so much cool stuff you can do with this creature and for that, I think it deserves a spot on Monster of the Week, which is why I made this video. Spoiler alert. So if you think that this creature is cool and you want to use it, as I said at the beginning of the video, there is a stat block in the description below, which has everything you need to run this monster in the form of a Google document. I'd also encourage you to check out my Patreon, where if you are one of my fantastic patrons, you can find uh, the whole fifth edition monster manual style stat block that I have created for this creature. And as I create for all my monsters of the week, they always have a little bit of extra lore and the artwork and stuff. And it's just fun to run monsters off of stat blocks like that and honestly it just helps me out so much so if you want to support the content you enjoy please check that out and consider becoming a patron today also a little bit of exciting news as a lot of you probably already know the video game that i was doing the soundtrack for called titankin released just about a week ago it's a JRPG with tons of high fantasy elements inspired by mythology from the place I live in little Nova Scotia, Eastern Canada. And I'm really proud of it. Chris, who did all of the amazing artwork and coding and basically made the game really breathes a whole new life into these fantastic characters. And I had so much fun doing the sound design and making the music for it. So if you want to check that out and that sounds cool to you, I'll link to the Steam page below as well. And if you really like the music, you can also get the soundtrack on Bandcamp. All of these things, Patreon, Titankin, the soundtrack, all that stuff just helps support me and I thank you guys so much for checking it out. But most importantly, thank you so much for watching, subscribing, liking, commenting, all that nonsense and just for being here. I appreciate it immensely. And if you have a monster that you'd like to see show up on Monster of the Week, please leave a comment below, get at me on the Discord and the Monster Suggestions channel, or tweet at me. Or hey, if you're in Nova Scotia and you see me driving down the street, just uh, yell a cool monster name at me, and if it sticks, then it might end up on the list. Lastly, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping here. As you've probably noticed, I'm starting to upload a lot more. The channel is growing constantly. There's new faces coming in all the time, and that's really awesome, but I need your help. I need you to help me define what type of content you'd really like to see on this channel. You know, we've been doing some collabs, some round tables. Recently, I uploaded the first Monster Plot Hooks Extended when I sat down with AJ and Fred and Folker to talk about Monster of the Weeks of Yore. And I'm going to be getting into doing some more player tip videos and dungeon mastery videos, some more shorts, all kinds of stuff. Honestly, I would really appreciate hearing your feedback and telling me what types of videos you want to see. Because we're at a really cool place right now with this channel where it's small enough that I can still kind of take it in whichever direction or directions we want to go. But it's big enough that I'm really starting to focus a lot more effort onto it because hopefully if we get to a place where I can be doing this full time in the next like few months... I'll be able to be putting out a new video almost every day, which would be awesome. So if you have any strong feelings about which videos you like or which videos you don't like that have been uploaded recently or are coming in the new future, definitely let me know because all of that stuff helps me figure out what type of content you want to see. And as you might have noticed, I'm just a huge fucking D&D &D nerd and I like talking about all aspects of it. And I'm having a ton of fun just exploring this space on YouTube, so... Again, thank you guys all so much for being here. I apologize for the long-winded housekeeping stuff at the end of this episode, but it had to be said. On that note, I will see you guys in the next video. Until then.